born or a premature conjunction. Uh, they say metals break apart if not alloyed right. Al an alchemical trick, they say, this is Albertus Magnus, the alchemi alchemists trick us with improper alloys. True alloys are malleable, that is, they can take blows of the hammer. When silver and gold are too soon joined, when silver has not been fully realized, when psychic reality, the metaphorical sense, the, the hardness and, and reality of reflection, the reflective resonating, whitening of the mind, then it easily, too quickly, becomes solified, solificatio it's called in alchemy. The sun dominates the moon, or as Philotheles says, the moon will dissolve over the wolf, oh, the sun will dissolve over the man. No, the man will dissolve over the woman. The sun dominates the fantasies. So that lunar imagining becomes solified, a spiritual certainty, a blazing truth, and a night world vision converts into day world visibilities with a strong surging rectitude seizes the lunar world, you've got your heart in it, attempting to establish its reign by means of solar energy. Fantasy speech becomes lunacy. Delusional statements, insanity. Gold poisoning prevents silvery reflection and the psyche can no longer hear itself speak what is said and what is heard become one and the same, and the only possibility is literalism. So when the moon, when the realm of the moon is dominated by the sun, covered over by the sun, the solificatio of the imagination, we have what we call paranoid delusions, literalisms. The night world in the day world. The second lunatic condition, psychiatry calls depersonalization. This can occur at any time in one's life, from puberty to old age, as you know. It can occur in organic psychoses, toxic states, hysteria, schizophrenia, schizophrenic psychoses, anxiety states, neurotic phobias, compulsions, depression, anywhere. And it occurs in all of us, can occur shorter or longer depersonalization in normals. Normals, you see, are a psychiatric classification of normals. It is a symptom not tied specifically to any syndrome. It can come and go, it can last a long time, and as one of the most common and universal psychic vicissitudes, it must be recognized as archetypal, as something essential to the soul. Now, let me describe the depersonalization to you. It is as if myself and the world have become irreal desold, without animation. Despite a sort of worried introspection, everything is as it is, but there is no dimension, no importance. All my functions are intact, that is, I know where I am, I sense, I perceive, I feel, I hear, I remember, but something more central has gone dead. There's apathy, monotony, flatland it's called, as if behind glass or in a vacuum or on another planet. Mechanical. Personal common life, the warmth of the sun-bathed world, suddenly useless, frozen, formal, and automa automaton-like. Here we have something similar uh, to what is described by Wallace Stevens in the blue guitar, stanza seven. And he uses the language of the sun and moon. It is the sun that shares our works. The moon shares nothing, it is a sea. When shall I come to say of the sun it is a sea, it shares nothing? The sun no longer shares our works and the earth is alive with creeping men, mechanical beetles, never quite warm. And shall I then stand in the sun as now I stand in the moon and call it good, the immaculate, the merciful good, detached from us, from things as they are, now, Stevens takes this problem, what we're talking about, depersonalization, 
And we can see it now as the reverse and puts it into the language of sun and moon. The reverse of the paranoid delusion. In the paranoid delusion, as I just described it before, everything fits into a deluded sense. Meaningful coincidences and significances. The soul silver is coated with gold into fixed importance and highest value. Gold everywhere. Here, however, the warm world, in depersonalization, the warm world turns into the great cold sea, sharing nothing. The earth and its works and its human bodies become merciless mechanical beetles, never quite warm. Everything is as it is, things as they are, but as if detached from us, because, as the poet says, I stand in the moon. Again a monstrum of sun, of gold and silver. This time the silver has dominated the gold, infused the day world so that it is sickly door with a pale cast of introspective reflection, stale, flat, unprofitable, become the uses of the world. When the moon usurps the sun's place, the solar world remains, but transfigured, as if taken to the moon. The heat's gone out of it. The color inclusus, or that inner heat that distinguishes the living from the dead. Then we find no values such as mercy and compassion, no sharing, no connection. Because the solar world, this world, has been silvered over, and now resonance only means hollowness. That danger alchemy warned of has taken place, a vitrification, a glassiness of animation, the world a glass menagerie, depersonalized. It's also described, by the way, by Coleridge in the moon-ruled South Pole in the rhyme of the ancient mariner, as the sun moves into, becomes the size of the moon, and then the moon ascends and we have a lunarization of the solar world. I should say one more thing about this vitrification, because we all get into this, we all get into this all the time. You see, the glass is crucial in alchemy. It's the vessel. Glass is, it's the mode of seeing through everything. But the glass is to be used as a vessel, it's not a substance. Psyche is not a substance. It's a mu it allows seeing through, that's it. So when the vessel becomes the substance of the work, that is when you try to take Psyche itself as our substance, then we vitrify, we have turned the Psyche into glass in, a, in, a, in an immovable way. This is psychology itself does this. Psychology is a vitrification. It's an attempt to tell you what psyche is. It takes psyche not as that mode by which we contain and see and reflect, but instead becomes a subject you teach at a university or get a diploma in. And the problem is, is even more difficult because the act of seeing through anything makes it transparent. And again we vitrify. The moment we've seen through something, we say, that's it and it's become a new piece of solid glass. So it's only if we can, if our seeing through dissolves and doesn't turn again into a new piece of glass, coagulate. Back to Hegel and back to alchemy. I'd like to call him by his first name. They didn't, they, what was Hegel called? You know, we say Tom Sass, Charlie Bohr, you know. What do they call him? Fred Hegel? <laughs> or George? Fred, we would have said. Back to George Willie Fred Hegel. <laughs> Could these conditions be necessary? They would imply yes. We might see these two conditions of lunacy in terms of silver and gold, moon and sun, but why must the soul go through these stages? Is it not a mistake, having something gone wrong, haven't we over-gilded the imagination or over-whitened the warm workaday world? Isn't it avoidable? 
can't insanity be prevented? Now here again, I'm wholly with my friend Sass. Insanity can indeed be prevented simply by calling off the medics who turn lunacy into insanity by the medical model of literalizing. But the pathologizing, the lunacy, and its mistakes cannot be prevented and is in fact necessary according to Hegel and quite usual according to alchemy. Prevention could only be imagined in terms of a psychic education that would be like an alchemical training, a knowledge of the metals, the seeds of the gods in our depths, and a long apprenticeship to the purpose of their workings. And even then, one may succumb to their purposes. What are the purposes then of these metals? What are these purposes? What are they doing with us? What is accomplished in the soul by these mistakes so-called of silver, to what purpose depersonalization, silvering the gold warm relation with objects and taking them to the moon? Now maybe it's an attempt on the part of the seed of silver, the natural force or the force in the metal, to assert the domination of the impersonal over the personal, detachment over warmth, by whitening and deadening the sun to show us that we are shades, that we can indeed stand on the moon at any time, that Persephone lives among us, and that which is truly real is not the object and the world or even the gold as such, but the psychic imagining or the anima reflective factor that the silver brings to the gold, and also that we first must go to the moon before we can properly inherit the earth. Or take the first condition, the paranoid delusion, which we've placed against the background of the solification of fantasy. This too can be seen as purposive, a necessary moment in the opus of soul making. These literalistic delusions are attempts by the sun to bring lunar fantasy into the world of persons and things, turning the psychological faith of the silver dove into convinced belief, giving wit and connectedness to the moony reflections that by themselves remain unshared and private. Doesn't seem that way, but if we go on with it, let us, let's make this a little clearer. A paranoid delusion, say, of a plot against me, or a cosmic scheme, or even a jealousy obsession, all involve, as Freud first pointed out, an erotic component indeed a homoerotic component, a moment of libidinal connectedness with sames. This is the gold attempting its conjunction with silver as if it were gold. The sun mounting upon and covering the body of the moon as if silver were the same as gold. So archetypal or alchemical therapy will approach a paranoid delusion as a gold silver amalgam, attempting to hear in it the sun's desire to unite with the moon's fantasy and bring it into the common world. Let me say this now at the end, just that left. If we take our cue from Thomas Sass, then our task lies neither in curing what is called lunacy, nor even in using the term in the old and common sense of moon mad, pathing strange, out of one's mind, deluded. Rather, our task, and by our, I mean everyone engaged in soul, not merely specialists called psychologists and psychiatrists, our task is the recognition of moon moments, of silver states, so that they can be understood as such, so that we learn to move to the moon, inhabit the moon, listen to the moon, as, in, as uh, that these are inherent to, purposeful, intentional, and appropriate in the workings of the soul. The medical model is a theology, as Sass recognizes. It is a model which holds the gods and makes them diseases. Lunacy becomes insanity, a secular diagnosis, an official epithet of the state, a godless condition, insane, 
insane, without reason, without sober speech, which is what insanity originally can be said to mean. So the problem of mental illness and mental health and psychology is myth, as Soth says. We need new modes of theology, new logoi, to hold the theoi and give them articulation, each in his or her own form. Today we have been working at one example, reverting lunacy to the moon and silver, so that we can understand lunatic processes as whitening of the psychic body and silvering the soul. This example implies that there might be other planetary modes of pathologizing, such as leadenness, mercurialness, martialness. Our particular example of lunacy offers a new direction for exploring other metallic seeds. It suggests a general psychopathology on an archetypal base, based on the moon, starting with imaginal reflection. An archetypal psychology returns the conditions we suffer to their home in cosmic divine events, gives them religious value, dehumanizes, desecularizes, depersonalizes them. Moreover, it turns to the poets as the physicians of the soul. I kept you all still for two hours, so your turn. Please. Do you have any suggestions for uh, a I had always thought that the physics, the advanced theoretical physicists were way ahead of psychology. That they realized that their quarks and quantum leaps and so on were, were uh, fantasies. And that if you go far enough out, you get to the moon with physics. But matter is, uh, isn't. It's not this kind of matter. It's uh, a fantasy. You get there with numbers and little drawings and things. It's there. It's already there. I don't think uh, it's our understanding. It's what we, who are non-physicists, do to physics that coagulate it. And then we try to be very, you know, like scientists, we get blunky. I think that the physicists are, are nearly every field is ahead of the psychologists in regard to these things. <laughs> yes, please. At one point when you were speaking, I, I really flashed strongly on the image of black and white being turned to a pillar of salt. But I, I'm not being able to do anything with that. Uh, no, it really belongs to another day and another chapter, because it has to do with salt, and I'd rather keep the... Li well, only, only that crusty kind of virginal thing. I'd, I'd rather leave that for another time. Yes, please. Uh, going back to your way of mining silver, with particular emphasis on um, mining it It would not be correlated with the four different functions. I say that literally. <laughs> well, maybe I should say, what do you, what, what, first of all, what do you mean by correlated, and second of all, what's that doing for you, that move? Well, 
I mean, why not just stick with brain, money, sound? Besides, there were five. So already the correlation has falsified what was given. Uh, but just stay with, the, with, with money and sound. Certainly that says as much as um, the schema of the four functions. Or holocaust certainly says more than sensation, doesn't it? Or forest fire. That's a, it's really extremely important that we don't lose the images for concepts. That's the whole, the whole virtue of alchemy is that it speaks in images all the time. Even though I had to do lots of abstracting and, and conceptual explaining, for which I apologize. Yes, please. From a psychiatric perspective, if you were, someone walked into your office suffering from what an ordinary psychiatrist would call depersonalization, and she had been calling a lunatic what sort of language would you use to talk to that person in? Uh, surely not psychiatric labels, or at least no one would do that. Uh, I think that none, the of the good, none of us good guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think if the ordinary psychiatrist would try and talk, or some ordinary psychiatrist anyway, would try and talk to the uh, sufferer in the language of here and now, that is, of I'm here on one side of the desk, and you're there on the other side of the room, what you're telling me, and so on, and so on. Would, but I take it you would not. That's right, I would not. Can you give us an example? Yes, I think that the figure that you've set up, the, the, the scene that you've set, with this person, as uh, Tom Sloss said last night, coming in at 2 a.m., let's say he, he was, there he is, depersonalized. Uh, this person here. This person is depersonalized, right? Uh, now, the usual therapeutic chair that we sit in is a chair of the sun. We usually want to clarify or relate or warm or do something of that sort. Now, the problem seems to me to be one of recognizing, if one recognizes it as a lunar condition, to speak to it in a lunar mode which means either by letting it talk uh, about all these things that have died and aren't there and yet are there but there's nothing in them and get into that kind of lunar conversation. It isn't in an attempt to change it but to explore the moon, learn its craters, meet the man who lives there and so on. Get into fantasy in some way because what this condition has done has sort of wiped out this kind of world. And the more appeal to this kind of solar world, uh, you're, work, you're doing um, allopathy. You're trying to work against what's there instead of homeopathy, which is sympathy of likes, uh, like curing like, getting into the same sort of place. Meaning, in some way, um, poetizing, fantasizing, imagining the very words that are spoken. A lunar reflective connection. Is that a start of an answer? I think so, yeah. Thank you. Well, I have to should go over here a minute. Yes. Yes, um, the, the question was, surely one of the functions of silver is giving birth to the gold, and that out of the silver comes the, uh, comes the gold. Now, there, isn't, there is one reference that I didn't mention where the silver is the mother contained in the belly of her infant. I 
worked. You, that's why I didn't know you worked that one out. <laughs> Oh yes, oh they're endless. Look, if we once begin to amplify and associate, we will be on the moon in a minute. <laughs> with, uh, with all the things to do with the Virgin and to do with, uh, oh my. Um, see, it would be a matter of understanding what that birthing of birthing of the sun is, how does that solar, and what kind of a sun is it that is born of the, of the moon? It's difficult to understand because our usual notion is the moon shines by reflected light. How does the silver, how does, how does the moon give birth to the sun? What kind of sun, what kind of place is that gold if it is silver-born. It's got to be utterly a psychic child, that sun. It's got to be a light that comes utterly out of reflection. Well, that's, uh, of course, that is with us wherever we want to see it. Yes, please. Yes, vitrification and problem. Yes. <coughs> According to this place, by working on psychic realities, they become more real. They gain body, they gain weight, <coughs> importance, they matter more. Now, when that begins to happen, you, it, the thing had to do with the transition from the moon to Venus. So when that begins to happen, you begin to get affected, you begin to feel affect and see this happening in the green world. You want to bring it in, green it. We can green this room. And that is raising it out of the vessel, out of the top of the vessel, that it goes up. Programs, projects, highs. Let's do this. Why don't we do that? Let's you and I... And then we lose the body that had been slowly, elaboratingly, uh, the recognition of, of the psychic reality of, of what we're into. Yes, please. This is not a question, it's merely an observation. Um, I have been pondering on it, not just since last night, when Dr. Stark mentioned that, but I'd like to uh, make a comment of what uh, coming in. Maybe the mind of a thousand people may come in if that many, a two of them in one event. Uh, they're usually brought in and in England by whatever means, by the ambulance, by the police, by the brother, by the father, by whoever, and whatever. And in England, uh, they do not come in, but they are brought in. Therefore, it is a matter of linguistics. Well, I don't think the man being, or woman being brought in feels it's a matter of linguistics. I think that was uh, Foss's point. I, I mean, he, what was this really belongs to this afternoon when we're all up here discussing, okay, all right? His point was precisely that point. Yes, that was precisely his point. Yes. Thank you. That's yes, please. Would I then speak to, from a golden chair to the paranoid, to the paranoid delusion? I think I would have to have that, 
golden chair there. That is that, that homoerotic connection, yes. Now, whether it's with that person or a connection with my own homoeroticism, that is the, the feeling of like, of likes, and liking likes would have to be there. I don't know more about it than that, I think. You see, one of the things that it does to you is that it's, it's um, frightening and cold, cold-making. You, you lose some of that warmth. But that kind of gold is already a gold that has emerged in terms of silver. We must always see gold in terms of, of its relation to or being birthed by silver. So there's always that reflection. Now what usually happens is that we meet the paranoid delusion from a silver chair, that is we argue with it. We meet it with the mind. Or try to convince it, or something like that. That isn't, that would not be the place, I think. But that might also be something we could discuss this afternoon. Yes, please. Carrying a dream into reality? Carving? Making the dream real. Real being green. I mean, what do you mean with that word real? I. I Oh, real as live it. That's all I'm asking. Just what, what that word real. Real as live it. Yeah, real as live it. Let's do it. both. It's okay and it's not okay and it depends on which alchemist and when and what and that's why the silver is so necessary because that's the resonance, the reflection that gives you a mirroring in regard to okay, not okay. The silver doesn't give you a rule. It gives you a, reflex a reflective possibility for seeing what's going on. Then the question of okay, not okay dissolves because it's only a matter of hearing and seeing. Whereas the gold sets up the golden rules or ironclad rules or whatever. I know that's an elusive answer, but that's probably the best. One more. Yes, please. I won't speak about the gold beyond what I've done, which is the gold in relation to the silver. Otherwise, that's a, again a whole like the salt. That's a whole other chapter. Sorry. Okay. So we're here at what time?